not for me, for Ukraine and for our soldiers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You have to prepare a little bit technically because I will speak in our native language in Ukrainian, so please, if it's possible, thank you so much. I will wait 15 seconds because I want to be understandable from the very beginning. <laughs> we can. Thank you so much. Ukraine is longing for peace. Europe is longing for peace. The world is saying it doesn't want any war, while Russia is claiming she doesn't want to intervene. Uh, someone here is lying. This is not uh, yet an axiom, but by far not a hype, only a hypothesis. Two, I visited the separation line in the Donbas just a couple of days ago. In legal terms, this is line separating Ukraine and temporary occupied territory, but in real terms, this is this, the line separating peace and the war. The line with the kindergarten on the one hand and the shell flying into it. On the one hand, the school, and on the other hand, the shell flying into the school playground with 30 kids nearby. On the other hand, the kids who are not heading towards NATO, they are heading towards their classrooms. Some of them might be having their physics classes, and with their el elementary knowledge of physics, even these kids will know that alleging that it was Ukraine to have uh, shelled these objects is just silly. Other kids might as well be having their math classes. They don't need a calculator to figure out the difference between the total number of shelling in the last two days and the number of times Ukraine is mentioned in the Munich security report. Yet some kids might be having their history class, and so when they see the, the shell crater in their playground instead of their school playground, they might start asking questions, has our world completely forgotten the mistakes of the 20th century? Where does the appeasement policy usually, uh, usually leads to? How did we get from the question, what's the point of dying for Danzig to dozens of millions having to die away, give away their lives for Duncan as well as dozens of other European cities? These are horrific history lessons. With this, I'm simply trying to make sure we have been reading the same textbook so that we are all on the same page about one main question. How did we get to this point in the 21st century where the war is being waged and people are dying in Europe? Europe. How come that time-wise it's already longer than World War II? How did we end up in the biggest security crisis since the end of the Cold War? To me, as a president of the country which lost part of its territory, thousands of people, the country surrounded by 150,000 army with heavy armament and machinery, on our borders. To me, this answer is obvious. The security architecture of our world is brittle. It is obsolete. The rules that have been agreed upon by the world dozens of years ago are not longer working. They are neither catching up with the new threats nor being effective in overcoming them, just like a cough uh, syrup instead of a good COVID vaccine. This security system is slow and failing us time and time again because of different things, egotism, arrogance, and irresponsibility of countries on the global level. As a result, some countries are committing crimes while others resort to indifference, the indifference that turn them into accomplices. It is symbolic that I'm saying this here. Fifteen years ago, it was Russian Federation who made the statement uh, here and uh, putting the challenge to the global security. How did the world respond? Appeasement. 
Uh, what do we have as a result? The annexation of the Crimea and aggression against my country at the very least. The U UN, which was initially called to, to safeguard peace and security, cannot protect itself when its own charter being violated as one of the Security Council members annexing the territory of another founding member, while the UN itself is ignoring the Crimean platform established to deoccupy the Crimea and advocate for the rights of the Crimean Tatars. It was here three years ago when Angela Merkel said, who can pick up the pieces of the world's puzzle? Only all of us together, she said, to, rush, um, to a rush of audible excitement in the room which stood up to applaud. Unfortunately, the collective ovation failed to transform into collective action. So now that the world is talking about the threat of a big war, it begs the question, is there anything left to pick up? The security architecture of Europe and beyond is almost destroyed. It's too late now to talk about fixing it. It's high time for a new one. The mankind did so on two occasions, having paid an extensively high price, it is the two world wars. We do have a chance to break that trend um, before it became a trend and build a new system before we uh, pay millions of casualties with uh, uh, based on the ex experience of two world wars without the third one to come in. Here in UN, I already, and in the UN, I already mentioned that there is no such thing as it is not my war in the 25th century. That annexation of the Crimea and the war in the Donbass is a blow to the whole world. That this is not about war in Ukraine, this is about the war in Europe. I mentioned this in 2019, 2020, 2021. Will the world be able to hear me in 2022? This is no longer a hypothesis, but not yet an axiom. Why not? Because it requires proof. It requires something more than just tweets and statements in mass media. Action is needed. The world needs this action, not Ukraine. We are going to protect our country with or without support of our partners, be it hundreds of pieces of contemporary armament or 5,000 helmets, we equally appreciate the support, but everyone needs to understand that this is not some kind of donation Ukraine should be reminding or begging for. This is not just a broad gesture that Ukraine should be bowing down for. This is your contribution into the European and international security for which Ukraine has been serving as a shield for eight years now, a reliable shield, holding back one of the largest armies in the world. That same army which is now poised on the Ukrainian, not EU member states' borders. And the, uh, uh, the missiles were flying into the Mariupol, not the European cities and thanks God. And after the fights and the destroyed airport in Donetsk, in Donetsk, not in Frankfurt, and it is always blazing in the Avdivka industrial zone which is being shelled. There it was very hot, not in Mormart. And none of the countries of Europe know what the military funerals are around the country in all regions and none of the European leaders knows what is it to regularly meet with the families of the dead soldiers. No matter what, we're going to protect our beautiful land um, on our borders. Uh, now either we have 150,000 or 1 million soldiers of any army. In order to help Ukraine, indeed, we don't need to hear how many of them are there and how many armament they have. We need to hear how many are there of us together to help Ukraine. We don't need to be reminded of the dates of the plausible intervention. We're going to protect our land on the 16th of Ju uh, February, on the 1st of March, on the 31st of December. We need other dates, much more than these dates. And everyone understands what kind of dates. Tomorrow is the day of commemoration of the Heavenly Hundred. Eight years ago, Ukrainians have made their choice and many of them have sacrificed their lives for that. Do you think that eight years later, Ukraine should keep calling for acknowledgement of our European perspective. Since 2014, Russia is convincing everyone that this was an erroneous past, path for Ukraine, that no one is waiting for us in Europe. Isn't it Europe that should be saying and proving them wrong? Isn't it Europe 
We should be saying today that our citizens have a positive attitude towards Ukraine joining the Union. Why are we avoiding this question? Doesn't Ukraine deserve to have direct and frank answers? The same is true about NATO. We are told the doors are open, but but so far the strangers are not allowed. If not all the members are willing to see us there, or all members don't want to see us there, be honest about it. Open doors are good, but we need open answers, but not the years and years of closed questions. Is, isn't the right for truth part of our opportunities? And the sooner, the better. The sooner summit in Madrid, for example, the Russian Federation is saying that Ukraine is, wants to join NATO to bring the Crimean back by force. Uh, it's good to hear that bring back the Crimea is something that they uh, mentioned their rhetoric, but they didn't uh, read carefully Article 5 of the NATO Charter. The collective uh, uh, actions are for protection, not for attack. The Crimea and the occupied lands of Donbass will come back to Ukraine, but only through peaceful process. Ukraine is consistent about Normandy and Minsk agreement. The foundation is the recognition of the territorial integrity and independence of our state. We want to have diplomatic resolution of the military conflict. Exclusively, I would like to emphasize based on their international law. So what in reality is happening now in Minsk in the peaceful process? Two years ago, with the presidents of France and Russian Federation and German Chancellor, we agreed about a full-fledged ceasefire. And Ukraine is committed uh, to these agreements, and we are observing them. We are uh, we keep uh, not responding to the provocations. We are submitting proposals to the Normandy foreign trilateral content groups, and do we see instead shelling and bullets? Our soldiers are, be, are dying. Our peaceful population is dying. Civil infrastructure being destroyed. The last two days have become very uh, symbolic. Massive shelling from the armament prohibited by the uh, Minsk agreement. It's important uh, to allow for the observers uh, for the OSC to visit. They are being threatened. They are being uh, scared. Uh, all humanitarian questions are being blocked. Two years ago, I have signed into law the unconditional access of humanitarian organizations to the detainees. But on the temporary occupied territories, they're simply not allowed. After two exchange of prisoners, this process has been stalled although and blocked, although Ukraine has been sharing the approved lists, torches until the death in the uh, notorious Isolatia prison, isolation prison in Donetsk, now is the symbol of human rights violation. In November, the two new crossing points that we opened in Lugansk Oblast have not been uh, put into operation, and we see this and the, as an obstruction under false pretext. And Ukraine is doing its best to push this discussion, to push the discussion for political questions as well. In the TCG, in the Minsk process, we have submitted the proposals and the drafts of law, but everything is blocked and no one is talking about them. Ukraine demands uh, urgently to unblock the negotiation process. At the same time, this does not mean that looking for peace is limited and restricted only by that. We are prepared to look for the keys in, to end the war in all possible formats and all possible platforms, Perin Paris, Minsk, Istanbul, Beijing, Barcelona. It doesn't matter uh, where in the world we'll, we will agree about the peace in Ukraine. Four countries will be there, seven countries will be or 100 countries. It doesn't matter. The most important, Russia and Ukraine, to be there. What is important is the understanding that we need not only us who need peace. The, the world needs peace. Uh, we need to restore uh, peace and uh, integrity in the internationally acknowledged borders. And I hope no one is thinking about Ukraine as a permanent buffer between the Russian Federation and the West. This will never happen. No one allow this to happen. Otherwise, there will be a question. Who is next? NATO countries will have to protect each other. 
I would want I want to believe that North Atlantic Treaty and Article 5 will be more effective than the Budapest Memorandum for the refusal. The fact that we refused for the, from the third biggest nuclear power, we received the security guarantees. We are no longer we don't don't we no longer have that weapon. Neither do we have the security. We have lost part of our territory, which is bigger in territory than uh, Switzerland, Netherlands, or Belgium. Millions of citizens have been lost. All of that has. Uh, been lost, but we ha still have something. We have the right to demand to move from the appeasement policy to ensuring the guarantees of security. Since 2014, three times Ukraine has tried to call for consultations for the guarantors of the countries who guaranteed the Budapest Agreement. Three times, no success. This will be the fourth time today that we're going to do this. As a president, for the first time, but both Ukraine and me is going will do this the last time. We are initiating under Budapest Memorandum uh, and call for the uh, and ask the foreign minister to have this meeting. And if, as the result of this, we're not going to guarantee of defense after this summit, we will think that Budapest memorandum is not working. It's and all the package decisions of 1994 have been put in question and compromised. In the nearest weeks, I propose to call the summit of the countries of the Security Council with the participation of Europe, Germany, and Turkey to resolve security challenges in Europe and come up with new effective guarantees, security guarantees for Ukraine, the guarantees that, are, that we need before we become the members of the Defense Council, being in this gray zone in a security vacuum, so to speak. What else can we do now? We can continue the uh, effective support of Ukraine and its defense capabilities, providing the European perspective, providing the support as are provided to the candidate countries, and providing specific timelines for Ukraine possible membership in the alliance. We need support for the transformation in our country to uh, create the Stability and Restoration Fund, the land lease program, uh, supplying new armament and equipment to our army, the army which is protecting the whole Europe. An effective preventive sanctions package is what we need to restrain the aggression and the energy integration of the Ukraine into European Union in the times when Nord Stream 2 is being used as a weapon. All these questions require answers. Instead, there is silence. And while this silence persists, there will be no silence in the east of Ukraine, in the east of Europe and in the whole world. I do hope finally the whole world will understand this and Europe will understand this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful to the countries who have supported Ukraine with their words, with their declaration and specific support. Those who are on our side, on the side of truth, on the side of international law. I'm not calling my friends out by names. I don't want some countries to be ashamed, but this is their business. This is their matter. These are their countries, their karma, and this is their consciousness that they have to look into. I, although I don't know how they will be able to explain these actions to the two people who were killed and three wounded Ukrainian soldiers today and three uh, um, girls from Kiev, 10, 6, and 1 years old who don't have a father any longer. At 6 o'clock in the morning, East European time, when Ukrainian uh, scout uh, officer was uh, killed from the artillery shell prohibited by Minsk. I don't know what he thought about at the last second of his life. He didn't really for sure understand what kind of agenda we need for the meeting to stop the war in the East. But what he knew is the answer to the question that I asked at the very beginning. He very well knows who is lying here. Rest in peace uh, to him, 
and to all those who have died uh, for the, in, during these years of war in the east of our country. Thank you. Mr. President, you gave a very impassioned speech just now, and we'll get to it in a moment. But first, I want to ask you that I'm not sure how many people in this room expected you to make the decision to leave your country and come here today. What was so important for you to be here, and what do you know about Vladimir Putin's intentions that perhaps the United States or others don't know, because they think that he's made the decision to enter your country? Thank you very much. Thank you for this question, uh, and thank you for uh, your for the invitation. It is very important uh, when Ukraine is being discussed for Ukraine for these for this information to come from the mouth of our uh, of of our country. Uh, I'm the president and our team. It's important for all our partners and friends not to agree about anything behind our back. And I do believe in our partnership, and I do believe that this is the case. Um, and uh, uh, I, had, I had very important meetings today with the leaders of different countries, and uh, still more to go. And I would like you to hear, to see, to ask questions, and get the answers, to understand the level of resilience of our country, that we're not panicking, we're very consistent that we are not responding to any provocations. We have our own vaccine already developed for that, uh, not as uh, good as COVID vaccines, but this vaccine is already eight years old. We know, know the things we need to react to and things we shouldn't. Of course, when our soldiers are being killed, we know we need to respond, but we understand who is killing us. We understand what these uh, military groups are. But uh, and we also understand when they are shooting from the localities surrounded by civilians to provoke us, for us to respond and uh, to start an escalation on the other side in respond uh, to um, the to our uh, fire. It's also important for me for us to be on the same page in terms of information. Uh, the uh, the fact that the partners are sharing with us the information, we are very grateful for that, by the way, for the cooperation of our intelligences. But we are in this tension for many, many years now. We do not think that we need to panic. We think these risks are indeed very high because we have more troops, 150,000 troops on our borders. Yes, indeed, that's a big risk. But a very big risk if we respond, if we do respond to one provocation or the other. On the other hand, I think that Russian Federation, and we, when we are talking about Russia, this, this is the people the whole people of Russia. So I think they will not be able to start to go to war against Ukraine. And although on the temporary occupied territories we have a lot of provocations and we see them, we see this how through the mass media they're disseminating different provocative information, we need to preserve our stability, we need to keep calm and be adults. Uh, are these, uh, from this, in these terms, Ukraine uh, army is more adult than others. Escalation on the so-called false flag issues. Uh, you have just talked about two Ukrainian soldiers being killed. The Russians say mines have exploded, Ukrainian mines on their side of the border. We've seen this rhetoric before. We understand the concept of false flags. But how tense is that? How do you think you can stop it? You know, how, how do you consider the level of the current provocations? Any provocations are very dangerous. As I already said, I think the most complicated question that in the Crimea, in the temporary occupied territory of the Donbass, along the borders of Ukraine and Russia, 
Uh, there's 30, 35,000 on the temporary Y uh, or, or temporary occupied territories. There's 35,000 more and 150 along other borders. So provocations are indeed very dangerous if you have this number of troops. Uh, one shelling, one fire, a cannon fire can lead to a war. And we perfectly understand, as I said, I do think so, and this is what our partners believe. I mean, the partners that are around us who have uh, joined borders with us, who know the history of the Soviet Union, and they do understand the kind of risks we are facing. The Poland, the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Moldova, they know what that could lead to. So we need to be very careful. I. I can't tell you about what will happen now. If you compare to 2014, 2015, there were ma more, much more casualties, unfortunately. When someone in, the, in mass media says that now this is the most horrific situation, that is not true. It is horrible. It's a tragedy for our nation, for our people. It is a tragedy, and in future you will see that this is, is the tragedy for Russians as well, who sh used to have good relationship with Ukraine. How do we stay neighbors, neighbors and live with each other from now on? But uh, we are in a different point of our uh, uh, life. We're not talking about neighborhood. We are talking about the war and that it shouldn't start. This is why the risk is high. What was shown yesterday on the temporary occupied territory, they've shown some shelling allegedly flying from our side, and then they have shown something flying all the way to Rostov region of Russia. This is just mere pro blunt provocation. These are pure lies. There's no one dead or wounded. This is just cynicism of such a high level that they are blowing up something on their side and, and shooting. This is not the first time since 2014 that they are uh, aiming their guns and uh, uh, shooting at the territory that they themselves control. This is the kind of cynicism. That's it. And we, well, all we care is about is peace. And I mentioned this many times to the president of Russian Federation and uh, Angela Merkel and Macron in 2019, and we have sent a massive amount of signals on the monthly basis. We have been passing on to different world leaders and directly to Russian federations that we are ready to sit down and speak. Pick the uh, platform that you like. Pick the partners that will be there around the table with us. We are ready for that, prepared for that. What's the point of us shooting and proposing diplomacy at the same time? Long, I'm sorry. You you can stop me when 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 you want. Can I ask you how you feel today compared to a few days ago? Because I think everybody's been quite amazed at the solidarity between the United States and your country and Europe and the united front that's been presented and also the extraordinary departure that the United States has used intelligence to telegraph exactly what it sees President Putin doing. You have said different things about that, that on the one hand it could sow panic and you're going to remain disciplined and you just said again, we're not going to panic. How do you evaluate the U.S. aggressive use of intelligence to try to dissuade President Putin? It's difficult for me to judge how uh, United States should be using their intelligence. I guess they're doing this in a professional man manner. This is their choice. But I'm grateful for the work that both of our intelligence has been doing. But the intelligence I trust is my intelligence. I trust Ukrainian intelligence who are on our territory, who understand what's going on along our borders who have different intelligence sources and understand different uh, risk based on intercepted data. We're talking about this in, in, this information should be used. I repeated this uh, many times. We're not uh, really uh, living uh, in delusion. We understand what can happen, to bo uh, happen tomorrow. 
but maybe the comparison I will make is not good, but just putting ourselves in coffins and waiting for foreign soldiers to come in is not something we are prepared to do. We are not going to advance on anyone, but we uh, stand ready for to respond to everything. We cannot remain passive. We cannot say on the daily basis that war will happen tomorrow. What kind of state will it, is it going to be? What kind of economy is it going to be? How can you live in the state when on the daily basis you're being told that tomorrow the war will happen, tomorrow the advance will happen? It means crushing national currency, money being taken out, business flying out. How can you live in that kind of country? Can you have a stability in that kind of country? No. And those who want to disbalance our country from within are multiple, and everyone wants Ukraine to be weak, weak economy, weak army, and if there is weak army, you can just go ahead and invade, and we won't be able to protect neither our people, neither our children, nor their economy. This is why our response is very calm to one piece of information or the other. We have to assess it. We have to think not how to react to what I just got, but I have to digest this information. I have to understand what will happen after my words, after my re uh, reaction to this, what will happen to my people, what will happen after these people will run to the banks to take money from their deposit accounts, after they start fearing and the panic will start. Uh, we have the information war, the hybrid war go going on. This is why Ukrainians are not giving up in different uh, sense of this word. We want to live day after day and protect our country. If you want to help us, we have lots of examples. Apart from this information, there are uh, a, a lot of uh, very concrete things. Strengthen our arm, give us more armament, strengthen our economy, invest in our uh, uh, country, bring your business in. If you're afraid, okay, give us cheap financing, give us uh, support, finance grant support. Why, uh, when we are giving money, why are we always getting these connections? You have to get do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and dozen of other reforms. Is there any other country in the world who would have such a strong army on the eastern borders with all these reforms implemented at the same time? That is not easy, but we're not panicking. We just live our lives. We want to live in it as a strong country. That's it. Uh, Mr. President, you talked again about NATO. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add. I'm, I'm sorry for, for interrupting you. Sorry. We had a discussion some time ago with one of the leaders uh, of uh, one of the leading countries, and we were talking about the sanction policy. We had a different vision on how sanctions should be applied when uh, Russian aggression will happen. And we are being told that you have several days and then the war will start. And I said, okay, then apply the sanctions today. Y yes, they say, we apply sanctions when the war will happen. I'm saying, fine, but you are telling me that it's 100% that the war will start in a couple of days. When, then what are you waiting for? We don't need your sanctions after the bombardment will happen and after our country will be fired at or after we will have no borders or after we will have no economy or parts of our countries will be occupied. Why would we need those sanctions then? What is this about? So when you're asking what can be done, well, lots of different things can be done. We can even provide you the list. The most important is willingness. So you're calling for, for sanctions to be leveled now. You also talked about NATO now. There's obviously, this is the big sensitive issue in this whole issue, right? And you have just talked about, again, wanting to be part of NATO. And yet you said you don't expect any NATO soldiers on your territory now. You specifically said we want no foreign soldiers with foreign flags on our, sol on our territory right now. What is your position on wanting to join NATO today? Mm. Yep. To respond to the first part of your question about sanctions, uh, the question is not about introducing them today. If the, the whole world understands that 
tomorrow there is a high probability of escalation by Russian Federation. And if Russian Federation is not pulling out their military, I think that would be a powerful step. If they are pulling back, then there will be no question. That's a soft option. I'm talking about the di diplomats who cannot apply sanctions automatically. I'm talking about the logic. If they pull back their troops, well, there will be no sanctions. But today, even the question of just making it public preventively, just the list of sanctions, for them, for Russia to know what will happen if they start the war, even that question does not have the support. OK, let's be honest then. Then I have a question. Why, if you can't even disclose what will happen to, to whom if the war starts, then the question is that it will be, uh, I, I doubt that it will be triggered after it even happens. In terms of NATO, we had a lot of debates regard, regarding this, and there were lots of discussions about the world leaders and my friends. And uh, meanwhile, I have lots of friends uh, among the world leaders. I will not name them because others will get offended. Ukraine is being supported, indeed. But Ukraine needs security guarantees. We are smart people. We are not narrow-minded. We understand there are lots of different risks because of NATO. There is no consensus uh, around uh, of their allies. Everyone is saying there is some distance that we need to, to go between Ukraine and the NATO that we need to walk. All we are saying is tell us how much time does it take to uh, complete this distance measured in years, and um, you see this, this is measured not just in hours, and you can see with the tragedies and lives, this is measured in the human life of Ukrainians. So tell us, on this distance, is it fair for us to get the guarantees while we're still walking this path, some diplomatic guarantees? Isn't it just simply fair? No one is pushing anyone against the wall with a question for us to be there in the NATO. That's not the case. We want to, we do, but unless, but until we have that possibility, what we want is the guarantees, security guarantees. But can I ask you? Just, just a second. I think, I think, cyber attack. Can, can, can I have another one for translation? Yes. But maybe you maybe You, you see, Russia is not here, but they're here. <laughs> That's, that, well, it's, it, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. I, how I about if two. I try to talk to you and you'll, you'll understand me? You, there are, I, I understand you from the very beginning. <laughs> but, you know, there are some very important things. Yeah. So what I want to ask you, Mr. President, is that the U.S. has its intelligence. You said you have yours. What is your interpretation of Putin's intention? Not his capability, his intention. Do you think that he will invade? He will decide to do that? Or he has? I don't know what the President of Russian Federation wants. That's why I propose to meet. <laughs> On that note, uh, the, oh, people are telling you need me that the, I have to stay on Syria. Huh? Sorry? Your people are telling me that you need to go. W were you at all afraid of coming here? Mm -hmm. No. Why? I, well, there are friends here. No, no, leaving your um. Well, I, my response will be very brief. I'm sure that our country is in good hands. This is not just my hands. These are the hands of our soldiers and our citizens. I think my visit here is important. And I would like to say that I had breakfast in the morning 
in Ukraine and I will have my uh, dinner in Ukraine as well. I never leave home for long. Thank you so much.